Welcome to part two of the Japanese urban legends iceberg. In this video, we're going to finish up layer one and move on to layer two, where things get a lot more opaque and mysterious. I also plan to launch a second iceberg series in parallel with this one, because Japan isn't the only place with bizarre stuff to investigate. So stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's begin. The Samejima incident was originally a thread on 2chan that alluded to some kind of unspecified event that was extensively covered up by the Japanese government. Like, the documentation on this is intentionally unclear because apparently even discussing it online draws the wrong kind of attention. So in a way, this is the first do not research entry in this iceberg, or at least it is according to 2chan. So there are many theories that claim to describe what Samejima actually was. It was suggested that it could be an oblique way of talking about the silencing of a 2chan user who posted under the name Samejima who was abducted by the Japanese government and beaten for an unspecified reason. This never had much weight beyond rumors though. Alternatively, it was suggested that Samejima might be an alias for a video distribution platform that produced illicit content for 2chan users, which explained why there was this deliberate attempt to obfuscate what Samejima was. This definitely has a basis in reality, but I never found it particularly convincing, as it's trivial for any cute channel to claim that their dark web honeypot was the real Samejima. And no one can disprove that because, well, intentional obfuscation would be exactly what a guilty 2chan deviant would try and do. The third and seemingly most straightforward theory actually turns out to be the weirdest. So much like the location of Iwo Jima, then the name Samejima, when read literally, seems to describe some kind of island specifically a shark island. Thus emerged a strange story about the disappearance of five 2chan users who visited an island allegedly called Samejima, somewhere off the coast of Hiroshima. As the story goes, the trip started off seemingly uneventful, but after all five of the channers failed to return to the mainland, authorities were called in to investigate. Some months later, four of the bodies were apparently found, except for one who remained missing. However, the day after the announcement, the story says, a user on 2chan posted, claiming to be the last missing person and claiming to still be at Samejima. So allegedly the authorities went back out to Samejima and found his remains, who, well, supposedly was found with human teeth marks on his bones. I guess the implication here is that there was some indigenous tribe living on the island that the government had gone to extensive lengths to cover up and which the group had at some point run into during their travels. Now, in retrospect, this story is less than credible. There is zero evidence of any Samejima island existing offshore, much less any disappearances off the coast of Hiroshima in this context. I mean, even if the government was covering something up, I doubt they could erase the existence of an entire island. It's just not very plausible to me. The first thread referencing the Samejima incident was posted on 2chan in 2001, and is now understood to have been the subject of a one-man ARG, with the original poster impersonating other 2chan members in a fake discussion thread to make the idea look, look more legitimate. It clearly worked pretty well, hence the many theories that other people put forward. So does this allow us to conclude that Samejima has no basis in reality? Well, not quite. The Japanese government does have a historical precedent for hiding unethical things from their own populace, and it's not out of the question that something sketchy in the same spirit as Samejima was voided down the memory hole in recent history. Well, the US has certainly done it before. However, I think it's safe to say that the urban legend of Samejima was never intentionally engineered to be anything other than open-ended food for thought. The seven mysteries of school are a trope in urban legends with a school setting. It refers to a narrative setup wherein there are often seven different but unrelated supernatural phenomena native to the school that coexist in the same general location. So culturally speaking, the number seven is seen to be an auspicious number, analogous to how the numbers four and nine are associated with ill omen. This has threads in Buddhism with concepts like a person having seven reincarnations, there being celebrations after seven days of a person's birth and festivals of mourning at the seventh day and week after a person dies. There is also a pantheon of deities called the Seven Gods of Luck that represent, well, good things like music, prosperity, and longevity. Due to this, the Seven Mysteries are basically a framework that a lot of modern media has used to structure stories. A common situation is that the mysteries keep each other in check. In stories like this, one mystery, like for instance a local curse, might start acting up because of a domino effect from something trivial, like someone forgetting to clean the, the local shrine, which itself is another mystery. So in these situations, it's up to the protagonist to set things back in order and restore symmetry. 
Other times they're used in a subversive way, like where six of the seven mysteries are conventionally explainable. But the seventh is something truly bizarre that just, well, escapes explanation and creates more questions than answers. The Utsurobune, or hollow boat, was an unknown and possibly extraterrestrial object that allegedly washed up on the shores of Hitachi province on the eastern coast of Japan in 1803. The incident was recorded in three texts. The Toen Shosetsu, the Hryoryu Kishu, and the Ume no Chiri, all of which survive as historical manuscripts today on display at various universities and museums. On February 22, 1803, an object was sighted off the coast of Haraya Dori by fishermen, who dragged it back to shore to show everyone. Allegedly, the object was 11 feet tall, 18 feet wide, and looked a lot like an enclosed bowl or flying saucer. The top half of the object was made of wood, the bottom was made with, of what looked like brass, and it had what looked like windows made of a glass-like or crystalline substance. So looking in, the fishermen found that the inside walls of their object were covered in panels etched with script of an unknown language, and there seemed to be amenities like food, bedsheets, and water scattered about. And also, there was a person inside. This individual was a young woman who was roughly 5 feet tall, with red and white hair and pale pink skin. She was dressed in what appeared to be expensive fabrics and addressed the fishermen in a completely unknown language. They couldn't talk to her and she couldn't understand them. And even more weirdly, she was holding onto a box made from an unnatural material that she refused to let anyone touch. No matter what the fishermen did, she refused to part with this box. The locals had a few hypotheses about her origins, the most popular one being that she was a foreign princess exiled for having an affair, and that the box she held contained the decapitated head of her lover. This incident concluded in one of two ways. In one version, the fishermen got unsettled, rightfully so, and sent her back out to sea. However, in another, they welcomed her into their community, where she ostensibly grew to old age. Obviously, the first reasonable conclusion to draw is simply that the woman was a European survivor of a shipwreck in the Pacific Ocean somewhere. However, this doesn't explain the fact that the object looked nothing like any lifeboat of that age. The language of the symbols inscribed on the inside of the object's walls also remain untranslated and unexplained, possibly because no one fully transcribed them for us to look at today. In any case, ufologists cite the incident as one of Japan's most compelling candidates for a close alien encounter, over 150 years before the Roswell incident ever became a thing, which is, well, pretty cool. Hikiko-san is pretty much the undead Japanese version of Jeff the Killer. The gist of the story is that the girl named Hikiko was physically beaten by her parents to the point where she developed deformities, for which she was bullied severely at school. Then the story diverges into a number of threads surrounding the circumstances of Hikiko's death, which all lead to a single outcome. In one, Hikiko decides to just end herself. In another, she apparently was killed by her father. In yet another, she apparently dies protecting her pet cat from her bullies in a strange way. The gist of it is that these other kids tied the cat to a car and start to drive off with it trailing on the road behind them, which prompted Hikiko to jump onto the cat and shield it with her body while being dragged behind the car for several miles. So predictably, Hikiko dies, comes back as a vengeful spirit, and proceeds to execute the people who wrong her by, appropriately enough, dragging them on the ground until friction causes bits of them to come off. Pretty straightforward and pretty standard for what is essentially a retaliatory death curse. Apparently, this legend spun off from a short story called Fukiko-san written in 19, 1998, that then later spread to internet folklore in around 2005. In practice, it exists as something like an, a morbid anti-bullying PSA, which I guess is a roundabout way of instilling good behavior in kids. Hanako-san is another bathroom yokai that has a rich mythos associated with her. And like Akamanto, Hanako haunts school toilets. She can be thought of as a Japanese equivalent of Bloody Mary, as school children will often challenge each other to summon her as a test of courage. Hanako used to be a schoolgirl, and there are many accounts of her death and subsequent return as an onryo spirit. She was either killed in an air raid while hiding in a bathroom, was murdered in a bathroom by a serial killer, or just happened to end herself in one after a short but tragic life. The air raid story, though, is the most popular version by far, and pretty much all modern portrayals of Hanako-san are written with this origin in mind. To summon Hanako-san, you have to knock three times on the first stall of the girl's bathroom, 
closest to the entrance on the third floor of the school. This apparently corresponds to the stall in which she was originally killed. Then, as you knock, you ask if Hanako-san is either there or is finished. Then you repeat the process on the next stall down the row until either something spooky happens or you run out of toilets. If Hanako-san does decide to respond, she'll say, I'm here, and the door in front of you will crack open. At that point, one of several things can happen. If you're lucky, she just might leave you alone, and you might get a glimpse of her or one of her limbs. However, if she wakes up and chooses violence, she'll grab you by the face and jam your head down the toilet hole, which, depending on the version of the story, might be another portal straight to hell. Oh yeah, and apparently the Yamagata prefecture has a different spin on Hanako-san's execution method, where a three-headed lizard will spawn behind the stall door and eat you for violating her privacy. Which, I guess, is still better than being thrown into hell. Apparently, one method of surviving Hanako-san doesn't involve outwitting her or exploiting a loophole in her curse's activation conditions, but instead by presenting to her, I kid you not, good grades. So like, homeworks, projects, or really any other piece of academic material with your name on it. However, the only way to guarantee survival in this way is with a perfect score on a written exam, for which the onus falls upon you to transport on your person into the toilet as an emergency safety measure in case of spiritual assault. Which is, well, you gotta do what you gotta do. It is assumed that Hanako has some awareness of the academic semester, as previous year's exams don't count and will still earn you a trip to hell. It kind of makes you wonder who, uh, which adult parties might have a vested interest in letting this urban legend spread. <laughs> Historians have traced the Hanako-san legend back to the 1950s, and since then she has been retold in all types of media, from films to anime to even visual novels. She's definitely an inherently marketable yokai, more so than Akamanto at the very least. The Red Room in Japanese internet folklore actually isn't the same thing as the dark web Red Rooms that everyone knows about these days, courtesy of JStation and Mudahar. In this context, it describes a cursed pop-up that can appear as you surf the internet that, when closed, will kill you. So the pop-up in question was allegedly formatted as a red window with black text, with an accompanying audio track playing the phrase, Do you like? Attempting to close this pop-up results in it just reappearing and replaying the audio. However, after a certain number of, of attempts, it will switch to a much more horrifying graphic with the text, Do you like the red room? with the audio pitch shifted to a child's voice, which is pretty unsettling. In the original story, victims were either killed by a phantom presence or ended themselves after being driven to madness. And the ambiguity is in fact intentional. According to the legend, the pop-up apparently circulated from the late 90s into the early 2000s, and was the subject of a notorious Flash animation recreation that rather defined the early era of Japanese internet horror. Now we are done with Layer 1 and it's on to Layer 2, which is the descent. Urban legends here are somewhat sparse on English documentation and do tend to lead to deeper rabbit holes that, well, far eclipse those of Layer 1. Those are generally folk tales but not for portion, but these are, well, other things entirely in a few cases. Regardless, let's begin. The Bento Curse is the name given to a bizarre phenomenon associated with the Chiba Lotte Marines baseball team, where its athletes whose likenesses are used to promote commemorative Bento meals will have some sort of misfortune happen to them in their career. Now, the sample size for this claim is actually pretty decent given the relatively small size of the Chiba Latte Marines community, which makes it even weirder. Uh, here are some examples. Originally in 1996, legendary pitcher Hideki Irabu's face was used to sell a lunchbox at Chiba train station, and shortly afterwards he completely ditched Japanese baseball to play instead for the New York Yankees, which was a huge kick in the, kick in the teeth for Marines fans. Some years later, teammates Yasuyuki Kawamoto and Toshihide Narimoto partnered up for a joint marketing scheme to promote the Double Stopper Lunch, and shortly thereafter had a massive falling out that caused them to pretty much end their working relationship and transfer to different teams. Tomohiro Kuroki was the Marine's ace starting from 1995, and he was also used to promote the special brand of Kuroki Bento. Then in 1998, he suffered a complete performance breakdown that resulted in the Marines losing 17 consecutive games, 
And then in 2001, he discovered that a shoulder injury that he'd previously written off was in fact major damage to his rotator cuff. This put him on the bench for more than three years, which again was a big kick in the nuts for any Marines fans. Apparently, the curse could even affect foreigners as well. A baseball superstar Bobby Valentine, originally from Connecticut, joined the Japanese Pacific League as a manager for the Marines in what was originally going to be a two-year stint. His face was pasted onto train station Bento, and like before, the Marines lost five consecutive games and he was fired prematurely after coming to conflict with the team's general manager. It's just really funny to me that Japanese lore suggests that there are some yokai associated with Chiba station bento meals that Hideki Urabu royally pissed off at some point in his earlier career, and which now has spent decades trying to dismantle his team. The Square Legend is a fairly obscure story surrounding the circumstances of five students who went mountaineering on an unnamed mountain somewhere in northern Japan. As the tale describes, the hike started off fairly uneventfully, with sunny weather and good visibility. The five were in good spirits and hiked out of civilization over the next few hours. It was only later in the afternoon that a sudden cold snap hit the group, followed by a blizzard of frightening intensity. The group decided to take pause underneath a cliff and wait for the whole thing to blow over. However, this was not to pass. High above them on the mountain pass, the wind and snow dislodged a boulder which struck one of the climbers, instantly killing him. This forced the other students to press on to the open, dragging his body with them. After hours of grueling exposure to the elements, the students happened upon an abandoned hut on a barren plateau under the mountain's peak. They dropped the body in the center of the hut's living room and boarded up for the night. But they discovered that the building's heating was in fact broken. This was extremely bad, as a few of them were already terribly exhausted and suffering signs of hypothermia, and the storm showed no signs of abating. The group reasoned that if any of them were to fall asleep in these conditions, they wouldn't survive till daybreak. In an attempt to keep themselves moving and awake, the students developed an ad hoc solution where the four of them would each stand at the corner of the living room. Then the first student would move along the wall to their right until they touched the second student at the next corner. Then that second student would move forward to the third student, and so on and so forth. Darkness fell, and the survivors started their game once pitch blackness had descended. The first survivor traced the edge of his wall and touched the second, who did the same to the third, who did the same to the last. Then the first survivor felt a grip on his shoulder, and the group kept rotating. They kept this up for hours until eventually the wind stopped howling and the first rays of dawn peeked under the door. Their dead classmate remained at the center of the room, precisely in the same place that they left him. It was only later they realized that in order to complete the rotation, they actually needed five people, since if they only had four, the fourth student would have run into the empty wall where the first student had originally started. So I guess they weren't in their right mind to have missed something so incredibly obvious, but I guess they were tired. The implication is either that the Square Game somehow resurrected the fifth student to participate, or that some property of the mountain or lodge can, well, raise the dead, I guess. Personally, I think that if the Square Game had any material components like a game board, then this story would definitely smell of viral marketing. Sort of like how Hasbro profits from selling Ouija boards whenever a cheap horror movie comes out in the West. In any case, the legend does show up in other Japanese media, like books and short films, so maybe it does in fact have a folktale origin, but I'm not personally buying it. Giant O, sometimes known as Big Head O, is an urban legend that describes a village of humanoid creatures with bizarrely oversized and malformed heads existing somewhere deep in the rural Japanese wilderness under Mount Kimpu, which today is known as Mount Yoshino. Giant O was originally mentioned in a post on the 2chan image board in 2006, where it was introduced in the format of a traditional ghost story. The original poster claimed to have been attempting to return to a secluded mountain village that he'd been to previously, then he had gotten lost in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere. He came across a mysterious signboard that was painted with the words Giant O. The letter O in this case came from a corruption of the characters in the village's name, where the wood it had been written on had decayed over time. OP decides to keep driving and eventually happens across a village. However, rather than containing the inn that he'd been to before, this village was decrepit and abandoned, overgrown with grass and mold. OP pulls up in the middle of the village's square and suddenly gets cornered by a group of creatures with oversized heads that are described as either shaking or vibrating unnaturally. 
they proceed to headbang aggressively in his direction. I'm serious, that's how it was actually described. And thus OP wisely backs up his car and gets the hell out of there. Giant O sprung up a cult following of dedicated Chu Channers determined to preserve the tail. I mean, it was definitely a compelling assortment of tropes that may have actually spawned a ARG had it ever reached the Western mainstream. OP's spooky tail disappeared into the internet's underbelly, and that was it. Or was it? See, in 2018, a picture of a signboard matching the description of the one in the story was circulated on Twitter, apparently having been found on the slopes of Mount Kimpusen in Kagoshima Prefecture. A travel writer living in Chiba, some 1900 kilometers away, decided to fly over and see the mystery for himself. However, he couldn't find any evidence of the signboard at all. What he did find was, well, a lot of secluded mountain villages. After speaking with the locals and snooping around the region shrines, he concluded that the story of Giant O was very likely assembled from bits and pieces of local folklore rather than being purely an internet fabrication. He went on to document his travels in two extensive blog posts, which are actually pretty cool and really make me want to visit Mount Kinpu. Seriously, it's worth the risk of being chased by yokai, that's for sure. That was the Japanese Urban Legends Iceberg Part 2. Stay tuned for Part 3, where we will explore the rest of Layer 2. I hope you found this at least somewhat entertaining, and thank you for watching.